What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review of Pillars of Eternity to Deadfire after 100%. Couple of things right off the bat, probably going to be some minor spoilers in this. Nothing major, like I'm not going to go over any big story beats or anything like that. However, I will likely touch on just like a few things here and there that could probably be considered spoilers. Next thing, I like to complete games 100% and then review them because A, it helps me stand out from all the other reviewers on YouTube, and B, the audience seems to enjoy that, so I keep doing it. Now, if you're unaware, Pillars of Eternity 2 is an isometric CRPG-style game that is, of course, the sequel to the original Pillars of Eternity. Now, normally I start this out by giving like a quick recap of the story. However, I'm not going to do that in this case because I already have a video series on the entire story, at least the main story, that is, of Pillars of Eternity 2. So if you want to learn about specifically the main story, you can check that series out. However, I do want to mention a couple of things. One, the main story is very short. It's not very long at all. And that is because most of the story is actually kind of tied in with a lot of the side quests and the factions and stuff that then kind of relates back to the main story. However, none of it is directly tied to the main story, and most things aren't keeping you from just doing the main story. So, because of that, the story kind of winds up being as long as you want it to be, really. Now, I want to talk about the difficulty of this game. There's the difficulty modes, of course. I will say that Path of the Damned is honestly what I recommend playing on, even though it's the highest difficulty. And that is because, A, once you actually get going in the game, it's not going to be that hard. Two... There is an AI editor in the game, and once you know how to set that up, Path of the Damned is going to be a cakewalk. Unrelated to the actual difficulty settings, there's a set of challenges you can access from the main menu called Magrin's Fires that are like unique challenges that you can turn off or on that are basically like game rules that will vastly increase the difficulty outside of the normal settings. Not really going to cover them here in any great depth, I just want to mention that they exist. With those things out of the way, let's talk about character creation. So, in my opinion, vastly improved over Pillars of Eternity 1. Two main things with that. A, you can multi-class. However, you do have to choose that at character creation. So it's not like other CRPGs where as you level up, you can choose to take points in other classes. That's not how this works. If you're going to multi-class, you have to pick it at character creation or when you're hiring your mercenary. Now that said, there are progression trees that are visible. Now this is probably my biggest gripe about the original Pillars of Eternity, is that it required a ton of like knowledge from just playing the game and leveling each class up, because there was no tree where you could look at like what abilities you were going to get at what level. Like It just wouldn't tell you. However, thankfully, Pillars of Eternity 2 at least addressed that. There is a clear progression tree that you can see when you'll gain access to abilities and that kind of thing, which in my opinion makes it vastly better just right there in terms of character creation. Now that said, the other thing to know about character creation is that Pillars of Eternity uses its own system. So if you're familiar with other CRPGs or, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons, that type of stuff, it should feel familiar enough, but it is a unique system. The more you play it, the better you'll be at it is really the best I can tell you. Again, there's an AI editor, but I'll talk about that later. Let's talk about the world of Aora, which is actually the world of Pillars of Eternity, and is where the upcoming Avowed will be set, of course. When it comes to the world in Pillars of Eternity 2, before I even talk about that, I've got to talk about the world state system. So this is a direct sequel from Pillars of Eternity, and because there were a lot of choices that you could make that would affect the world, Pillars of Eternity 2, in my own words, uses what I would like to call a world state system where at the beginning of the game, you can choose either a predetermined set of choices for how you completed the first game, or you can import a save from the original Pillars of Eternity. That will then, of course, you know, use your decisions. All of these will affect the world. Now, because of that, depending on those decisions or the predetermined world state that you picked from the list, some characters might be dead. Some of them might be alive. All of them could be dead. So it does affect a lot of things like that, which just right off the bat adds a lot of replay value in my opinion. Talking about how the world is built before we get into exploring it, Pillars of Eternity has some truly interesting lore. And well, again, I don't want to go into it in too much depth, obviously, or would be here all day. 
I will say that the game definitely expands in a lot of ways through the main story and through its DLCs and through just exploring on the world of Pillars of Eternity. It just expands that lore, gives you a lot to really dive into, a lot to talk about, which is why at some point in the future I'll eventually probably do a Pillars of Eternity like lore series. But more to the point, outside of, you know, expanding the universe of Pillars of Eternity, let's talk about some more specific things about the world. One, this game has probably my favorite world map of any CRPG just across the board. I love this world map because you actually get to explore it, right? If you're unaware, Pillars of Eternity 2 is set in the Deadfire Archipelago, hence the Deadfire name, and you get to eventually captain a ship and sail around the archipelago. But it's not just like predetermined lines or you can only go to city to city. You actually get to travel the world. Like the map you see is what you can explore. And you're going to find all sorts of stuff. You can find lost islands. Once you explore and clear the dungeon on them, you can then name the island because you found it. There is a dynamic weather system. There is a day-night cycle. Because you're sailing at the sea, there is a real chance you could run into storms, which will lead to a text event, which isn't that fun, but I thought the storm idea itself was pretty cool. And, as I mentioned, you can captain a ship, which means there are several ships that you can actually buy in the main city, Nekataka. They have like a ship right there that you can buy several different types of ships from and then outfit and upgrade them, which I want to talk about specifically because if you have high morale for your crew, because you're going to be hiring a crew to man your ship to sail, if you have a high morale with your crew, which involves, you know, feeding them, you know, food and drink as you're out sailing about because time is passing. So you have to like prep your ship to do that. They'll sing these sea shanties. And what I thought was a really cool detail that I didn't realize from hundreds of hours of playing this game, actually, I actually learned this by reading some of the tweets on Twitter from Josh Sawyer, who was, of course, heavily involved in the entire Pillars of Eternity franchise. It's sort of his franchise in a lot of ways, despite being owned by Obsidian. Something really cool I learned from the sea shanties is that depending on the makeup of your crew, the sea shanties will change. So if you have an all-male crew, the sea shanties you hear while you're sailing will be an all-male voice. Whereas if it's, you know, all females, it's all female. And then if it's a mixed crew, you'll actually hear male and female voices, which I thought was just a really cool touch. So I thought I'd share it with you guys. Moreover, in terms of world building, when you go to different areas, like if you are in a small tribal village and the currency you get there is going to be the currency they would use, shells and stuff like that. But then if you go to the like Valian Trading Company and do missions for them, it then gives you their currency. That sounds annoying, but the game auto sorts all of it for you. So you don't actually have to like figure out how much money you have and the money you have, you can use anywhere. So it's like this cool bit of world building that like people are using different types of currency. However, you personally don't have to sort any of it, which I think makes it really cool. Needless to say, I think world building and exploring the world in this game is really cool. Honestly, some of the best that CRPGs have to offer, in my opinion. And the last thing I'll mention on that front is that some of the best content in the game, nothing will lead you to. You just have to go find it on your ship, like sailing out and about, like find islands that nothing sends you to. And you'll explore them and you'll find something really cool. There's like might be a quest even if you go there but nothing's going to send you there. And I thought that was awesome. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk combat. First, I wanna go over the ship combat. So because you are sailing, you're doing a whole pirate theme thing going on in the Deadfire Archipelago, you're sailing this ship, you're going to run into other ships and you're going to have like ship to ship combat, right? Ah, it's not great, frankly. Like that's probably the nicest way to put it. The actual ship combat takes place in like text events and it's really bad. Like the system itself is functional, but Christ, it is not fun. So what I recommend people do is buy the fastest ship you can in Nekataka and instead of engaging the ship to ship combat, like just choose the full speed ahead option every time with the fastest ship until you're able to board the enemy ship because that's going to take you back out and bring you into actual combat, which will be over much quicker and is much less of a headache than the ship-to-ship -ship combat, which is ostensibly terrible. Now, for regular combat, it comes in real-time with pause or turn-based. Turn-based was added much later through patches, and while both are pretty solid, honestly, I've tried both, 
That said, I think in this particular game, real time with pause is the way to go. Like most of the time, I prefer turn-based, but Pillars of Eternity 2 has a really good real time with pause system. However, like anything, there are pros and cons to it. Now, on one hand, I think it's really smooth, I think it's intuitive, I think you can actually find the information you need to find in it, and I think you'll get better as you play because you can actually kind of see what's going on, you can see what effects the enemy has, and as you become more acquainted with it, I think you'll get better at it. As I mentioned earlier, there's an AI editor. Now your AI editor is not save game specific. Once you've saved an AI layout, any game you start is gonna have that AI layout. So because of that, after probably your first time through and you kind of learn what works best for each character, you can literally create an AI that will work the entire game for that character. So as you're gaining companions on like a second run through, you can just click on that AI that you created from your first game and it will carry them through the game and you'll never have to touch it. On one hand, it does help manage your party of six because micromanaging real time with pause can be a little difficult. However, I would say this almost goes a step too far because it's to the point where like, if you know what you're doing, you can set up this AI to like do everything for you. You'll have to engage precious little with combat this way. So it, like as funny as it sounds, it's almost too good at what it does. I would like something in between this and other games AIs where you can only click like one thing that the AI will automate. It's like if we could just find a little bit of middle ground here. I do want to mention though, and this is just a random aside about this AI editor, it reminds me almost entirely of the AI system from Final Fantasy XII, of all things, which I used to play a ton when I was a teenager. And then I started playing this game, you know, as an adult, and I was like, I know exactly where this AI is it maybe inspired by, at the very least. And as a result, I took to that AI immediately. And like I said, it just, it easy modes the game, even on the highest difficulty. But with that out of the way, let's talk about some companions. Now, as I mentioned, world state. Some of these people can be dead. It's very possible. However, before we even talk about that, I do need to talk about the difference between companions and sidekicks. Companions are returning characters from Pillars of Eternity, as well as a couple others, that will actually have a full-blown quest in addition to dialogue. However, then there are sidekicks. Sidekicks are usually kind of in between a full-blown companion and a mercenary you just hired. Sidekicks will usually have dialogue, however, they don't have a quest associated with them. There are a few different sidekicks. Most of them are okay. Like, again, they don't have a quest or anything, so they don't really go through any growth. It's just like a character you can pick up. Sometimes they'll say things, not often. And then there's the actual companions. A lot of these are actually returning characters from the first game, such as Palagina, Adair, Adir, I don't know, Aloth. So some of those are actually returning characters, which I thought was really nice, because again, it's a direct sequel. And again, depending on the world state, your interaction with those characters could have been entirely different, or they might just straight up be dead. Could go either way, which again, I think adds a lot of replay value. Now, I'm not going to go over every single companion in depth, but I will say this. Most of them are intended to represent a faction in your party. This becomes like a whole thing throughout the game because what you're doing and what the factions of the game are doing are trying to find something. And again, I don't want to spoil anything major, but essentially some of your companions are kind of like low-key a spy. Like the game even points it out. It's not like a hiding thing, so this, is, this isn't really a spoiler. But like some of these people are literally just with you so they can report back to their appropriate faction. The game tells you that. And while you can certainly earn their loyalty, some of them can be romanced, of course. I just thought that particular interaction, to me personally, was very interesting. Again, I don't want to go ev over every single companion. I will say I do like pretty much all of them, though. I thought all of them were really cool, had cool stories. The game goes out of their way to make unique things about them. More often than not, some of them have unique things that your character themselves can't make through character creation, such as Takehu, who is a godlike Amawa of the Huana faction, is a druid, and he gets a unique shapeshift of a hammerhead shark, which I thought was really cool, because like your rest of your characters can't do that. And then, of course, you have Palagina, who is godlike, but for her story reasons, has actually kind of like become less godlike than most of her the other godlike. Now, I've mentioned the factions a few times, so let's talk about them and kind of how they interact with each other. 
So you're in the Deadfire Archipelago, right? This archipelago is the ancestral home of the Huana, the kind of tribal folk that have lived here basically for all of time, or at least as far as anyone can remember. They are very much so a tribal people in a lot of ways. They have a caste system, but the most important thing to them is control over their archipelago. You might be wondering, how are tribal people keeping up with, like, the rest of the Pillars of Eternity world, especially if you played the first one? These people have guns. How are these tribals doing this? That is because the tribals practice what they call water shaping, which is something your companion Tekehu will do, actually. This water shaping is no joke. It will let the people in the water shape guilds who learn how to do it actually control the flow of water. Again, we're on an archipelago. It's real hard to fight an enemy who can just straight up sink your ship by willing the ocean to do it for them. So despite being tribals and, you know, inherently coming off a little primitive, these people, like, can literally just have the ocean swallow ships. They are a force to be reckoned with in their archipelago. Now, on land, it's a different story. But, again, the Huana control the archipelago. And that archipelago is rich in resources, specifically Audra. If you're unfamiliar with the series, Audra is, like, engaged in, like, the cycle of souls. I don't want to get into it too much. I actually do have a video about the world of Aeora that I kind of made for the Avowed announcement. So you can check that out if you want, like, an in-depth explanation. But suffice to say, the archipelago is rich in Audra. And the other factions want it. And that's kind of like the diplomatic, so to speak, situation of the archipelago. Because the Juana control it. Outsiders are coming in to get at this Adra and set up shop here. And the Juana are kind of like playing this game of needing to trade with people, but also not wanting to cede control of their archipelago. So there's kind of some back and forth there that's kind of the political drama. So who are the people coming into the archipelago? So first we have the Valian Trading Company. This is the faction that Palagina is associated with. These are merchants from Old Vela. These people are just old money. They're all about making coin. So they want to come here, they want to set up shop and operations on Audra sites, and they want to mine this Audra because it is incredibly valuable. Now they're coming into the archipelago, making deals and contracts with tribal villages, exploiting them, and mining Audra. Then we have Rawatai. Rawatai is like military might. They are a collection of a lot of different races, really, but primarily Amawa. There are two different kinds of Amawa, by the way. However, they are not native to the archipelago like the Huana. And again, they're not entirely just Amawa. There are other types. Rawatai's homeland is just racked by storms constantly. It is like a perpetual storm there. And because of this, they've developed like this militaristic society in order to gather the things that they need to do to band together and survive there. And they're coming to the archipelago to primarily investigate an area called Andra's Mortar because it has storms that are very similar to the ones that just hover over Rawatai all the time. So they're looking for a way to like deal with that while also trying to set up shop and take control of the Deadfire Archipelago, which they subtly, not so subtly, imply all the time. And then we have the Principi. These guys are just straight up pirates. So you're in an archipelago, there's ships everywhere, gonna be some pirating. The Principi are pirates. However, there's kind of two factions here. There's the sub-factions of like the Old Blood and the New Blood. And they very much so disagree about how best to be pirates, basically. There's just a lot of infighting. They, of course, make their living by, you know, being pirates. And obviously, they don't have a lot of friends, but they are a faction that you can join. I just want to throw that out there. Now, those four factions are the main factions. There are a lot of others, but mostly it's just like individual villages and things like that. But I'm hoping that what I've told you there is just kind of like the overall situation in the Deadfire Archipelago. Things are tense, even outside of the main story, which has much bigger implications than this. I really like this setting. I thought it was really cool. The pirate theme does wear a little thin. I will give people that every time. However, the rest of it, the political intrigue, the back and forths, which way you can go, there's several paths through the game that involve dealing with these factions. That part is peak. I love it. Now, let's talk DLCs. The DLCs are so good. All of them are just really good. 
There was a lot of small ones that were like appearance packs. And then, of course, the Magrins fires. The games didn't launch with those. However, the big ones, uh, Seeker, Slayer, Survivor, Beast of Winter, the other one that you go into like some archive to investigate something. I forget the name of that one offhand. Forbidden Sanctum, I think it is. They're all really cool. All of them add tons of lore to the game. Beast of Winter is my favorite, hands down. Most of them have you interacting with one of the gods of Aora in some way, which you'll of course be doing as part of the main story as well. But the best thing about them outside of the story being told is just the lore that gets added to the game. It's awesome. That said, in my opinion, not a ton of choice for the DLCs. They're good, like they're very good stories. I love the lore that gets added, but m not a ton of choice involved in a lot of them. Like there's a little bit of choice, but there's not a lot of choice. That said, my other criticism of the DLC is simply that most of it is in-game stuff, or just about. I think the earliest one starts at like level 15 at a max level of 20 in-game. So again, uh, very late game stuff. So I think that is about it for things I wanted to talk about. So as per usual, let me wrap up some things I did not like about the game. First of all, standard CRPG stuff. The inventory system is god-awful. It's really bad. It's not unusable, but it's bad. Everything is incredibly small. Again, I'm better with inventories than most people, honestly, so I wouldn't say it bothered me, but I could tell just by using it, people hate this inventory. Second thing, again, Pillars of Eternity uses its own system, and because of that, there's nowhere to look to like learn the information. I think character creation could do a better job of explaining some things. That's a very common CRPG problem that CRPGs are just now, like this year and maybe like last year, are just now starting to address. Try to find better ways to convey what they want to convey in character creation. But again, very common genre problem rather so much than this game. They could do a better job of explaining things in character creation. The main story, again, very short, potentially very disconnected from the rest of the game, which isn't unheard of. It was actually their response to criticisms about how long Pillars of Eternity 1 was. That said, I do not understand this. So I can speak speed run, so to speak, Pillars of Eternity 2 in like maybe 10 to 20 hours if I really want to. I have some of the achievements for beating that game while resting like less than 10 times. I can't 100% the first Pillars of Eternity simply because there's a Kickstarter achievement and because of that I've never actually bothered to try. My point is people were saying that game was super long. It's like it really wasn't, but okay. People complained that Pillars of Eternity 2 was just too short. Which that one I think is fair. It is very short. Like if you're running through just the story, you could beat this in easily less than 10 hours if you know what you're doing. Uh, again, the combat AI, almost too good, really. Like it just, it lets you automate everything to the point where it's like, why am I even playing? You know what I mean? Almost hard to explain. It's like they overtuned that system. It's so good, almost takes away the point of the combat. It's, re it's just weird. And then there is... In my opinion, this wasn't a problem per se, but I do kind of agree with people. I don't feel as strongly about this as a lot of people do, but like the pirate theme wears a little thin. I, I agree. Again, it didn't bother me personally because I was so caught up in the fantasy aspect of it to some degree, especially if you're doing all the side content. And it's like, I get it. There's pirates. So again, personally, not a huge gripe of mine, but I definitely do see how people could get real tired of that aesthetic. So to wrap this up, would I recommend Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire? Absolutely. It is such a great game. In my opinion, PoE 2 here honestly improves on the original Pillars of Eternity in basically every way. Most of my complaints with PoE 2 are minor. They're annoyances. It is a fantastic game that adds a ton, ton to the lore of this universe, and I thought it was really cool. The stories are really good. I loved all the characters personally. Hands down, one of my favorite CRPGs, period. So I would absolutely recommend you pick this game up and play it. As with any game, it's not perfect. There's always room for improvement. The next game in the universe is going to be seemingly first-person RPG, kind of taking a step away from the isometric because factually, PoE2 did not sell very well. It wasn't a flop. It did make money, from my understanding. However, it actually sold much less than the original Pillars of Eternity, which is, in my opinion, is a real shame because, again, this is a great game. I honestly do believe that. And if you're a fan of CRPGs, you should play this. With that out of the way, guys, truly, 
Thank you so much for watching. I could not do this without you guys. The channel is just getting a ton of love here lately, and I just cannot express enough how thankful I am for that after so many years on YouTube just doing this stuff. It's truly incredible for me to see. In that vein, if you guys want to like, comment, subscribe, help me out with that YouTube algorithm, show the video some support, I would truly appreciate it. But regardless, any support is welcome. Thank you so much. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.